Welcome to episode 3 of Books I Have Skimmed, Chapbooks of the 18th Century. There'll be riddles and games. Oh god, the mad pranks of Tom Tram, son-in-law to Mother Winter. Oh, I think we've changed some of the definition of pranks over the years, because there's the time when he was sent to buy soap, not overspend, but make sure it got home safely, so he spent a lot of money having it carried back in a hand barrow. And there's the time when he ran some pins into the heads of turkeys to convince the owner that they'd died of sickness. The world turned upside down, or the folly of man exemplified in twelve comical relations upon uncommon subjects. Oh, John Ashton hates this one. I can't imagine why. So the poem goes on, it's alright I suppose, but it ends abruptly with, This is quite enough of this specimen of the style of poem, and luckily the illustrations explain themselves. The original of this must be filthy. One line caught my eye in The Wise Men of Gotham. Tale 13 is rather too broad in its humour to be reproduced. Let's look it up elsewhere, shall we? Now it's a little hard to follow the language in this, but it seems to be about a man that bets his wife she cannot make him a cuckold. So she damages a barrel of ale, and gets him to stand there with his finger blocking the hole until she can find a tap for it. While she searches for a tap, she runs off and has sex with the tailor. These are the classic rural British values that Brexit supporters are so keen that we uphold. Oh dear. Joe Miller's jests, being a collection of the most brilliant jests and most pleasant short stories in the English language, the greater part of which are taken from the mouth of that very facetious gentleman whose name they bear. Joe Miller's jokes are absolutely terrible. I have a whole book of them, I'm going to do a video on those at a later point, so I'll skip past this chapter at the moment, thank god. Now this is more like it. A whetstone for dull wits, or a posy of new and ingenious riddles. Of merry books this is the chief, tis as a purging pill to carry off all heavy grief and make you laugh your fill. Now these are terrible, but they're also quite fun. A wide mouth, no ears nor eyes, nor scorching flames I feel. Swallow more than may suffice for forty at a meal. It is an oven. To ease men of their care, I do both rend and tear their mother's bowels. Still, yet though I do, there are but few that seem to take it ill. Have you worked it out yet? Have you? Of course you have! Tis a plough which breaks up the bowels of the earth for the sowing of corn. What is it about corn? Why are corn people so weird? Now it's not a great riddle, but this mermaid not giving a shit is truly wonderful. By sparks in lawn fine I am lustily drawn, but not in a chariot or coach. I fly in a word, more swift than a bird, that does the green forest approach. It is an arrow drawn in a bow by a gentleman archer. Now, who's ready for round two of riddles? Because now we're into The True Trial of Understanding, or Wit Newly Revived, being a book of riddles adorned with a variety of pictures. Once Hairy Centre did transgress, whose dame both powerful and fierce, though Hairy Centre took delight to do the thing both fair and right upon a Sabbath day. Have you got it? Of course you have! It's an old woman whipping her cat for catching mice on a Sunday. What a time to be alive. Promotion was lately bestowed upon a person mean and small. Though many persons to him flowed, yet he returned no thanks at all. But yet their hands were ready still to help him with their kind goodwill. It is a man pelted in the pillory. There was a sight near Charing Cross, a creature almost like a horse. But when I came the beast to see, the head was where the tail should be. What could this mysterious creature be? Oh, I know, it's a mare with her tail tied to the manger. Let's just take a moment to imagine how self-satisfied the writer of these must have been when no one could get them. I'm not going to get into the text of this one, but this one has a short amount of this song before Ashton weighs in with The foregoing is nothing like so witty or funny as the Black Letter Ballad. A copy is in the British Museum, which although it has been reprinted, is not generally known and is too good to lose. And then from there he's gone on to say, This ballad, which is circa 1640, was stolen wholesale by Robert Burns, as an examination of John Barleycorn will prove. He's reprinted this chapbook just to cut it off part way, just so he can sneer at the works of Robert Burns. This is a man with an axe to grind, do not get on Ashton's shit list. 
Now, the black letter ballad that Ashton's chosen to publish here admittedly is fairly good reading. It's about John Barleycorn being at the hands of a horrible murder a few times over at the hands of these villagers until his friend John Goodale turns up and takes away the villagers' tongues, legs or sight. Well done, John Goodale. I guess you're the hero or something. And then we come to The Whole Life and Death of Long Meg of Westminster, which is the rarest of things a female protagonist in one of these old books, and more than that, a female protagonist whose main shtick is to wander around stoving in the heads of abusive men with cudgels. After a brief interlude of going overseas and killing foreign men for king and country, she comes home, dresses as a man, gets in trouble with the law, gets in a sword fight, but they all go to the pub and everything is fine. She fights a gang of thieves, fights some more constables, goes to France, fights some Frenchmen, disappointingly submits to her husband, but makes up for it later by hanging a miller and burning his crop in front of him, before retiring to Islington and kicking the shit out of a few more constables. Oh, more joke books. Hooray. At least these ones spell jokes badly. Jokes upon jokes, or no joke like a true joke, being the diverting humours of Mr John Ogle, a lifeguard man, the merry pranks of Lord Mohun and the Earls of Warwick and Pembroke, with Rochester's dream, his maiden disappointment, and his mountebank speech, together with the diverting fancies and frolics of Charles II and his three concubines. To make it spicy in the end there, just to, just to keep your interest. Now we're into a section which is largely a mix of fake news, propaganda, and just badly written histories. And wonderfully, we have the Youth's Warning Piece, or the tragical history of George Barnwell, who was undone by a strumpet that caused him to rob his master and murder his uncle. Who wouldn't want to read the story of this guy, and this apparent strumpet showing yet another unachievable body standard for women? The history of John Gregg and his family of robbers and murderers, who took up their abode in a cave near to the seaside in Clovalley in Devonshire, where they lived 25 years without so much as once going to visit any city or town. How they robbed above 1,000 persons and murdered and ate all who they robbed. How at last they were happily discovered by a pack of bloodhounds, and how John Gregg, his wife, eight sons, six daughters, eighteen grandsons and fourteen granddaughters were all seized and executed by being cast alive into three fires and were burned. Obviously enough, this is just the story of Sawney Bean with the name changed, which I suppose is fine if you're just trying to churn out a load of cheap fiction, but if you're doing that, couldn't you think of a better name than John Gregg? John Gregg? Uh, sorry to any John Greggs who are listening, I just don't think you have a very interesting serial cannibal name. There's a whole load of other hideous bloody crimes in here, mostly where people kill their families and have ghosts dob them in to the police afterwards. And finally, The French King's Wedding, or The Royal Frolic, being a pleasant account of the amorous intrigues, comical courtship, catwalling, and surprise marriage ceremonies of Louis XIV with Madame Matelon, his late hackney of state. Tragically, this promises a comical wedding song, but we only have the title page. Oh, John Ashton, you've really let me down this time. I'm not getting... My fill of comical wedding songs. Unforgivable. So, that's it. Chatbooks of the 18th century. I wholeheartedly recommend you get your hands on the PDF, have a browse through, let me know if I've missed anything that's tremendous, and I'll cover it in a future video. Thank you for sticking through to the end. Obviously enough, I'm a new channel, I need to know if you actually want me to make more of these, so like and subscribe if you want me to make more. And if you don't like and subscribe, I'll make more anyway, just to spite you. Yeah.